Wasn't that beautiful? You guys are amazing. You both, you two are amazing. So it's time for our opening prayer. So I'm going to invite the prayer chaplains to rise. Ah, they anchor consciousness for the whole community. I'm going to invite you to encircle the community. I'm going to invite Kathleen O.D. to come on forward with our prayer box. And I'm also going to invite anybody who understands themselves as being someone who anchors consciousness for, them, for this community, for the world, to feel free to rise and stand up and encircle this community. And if you're listening on the live stream, just know that we're holding you as well. So we breathe together into this awareness that we are light. That is the invitation. So whatever it took for you to get here this morning, letting that fall away, allowing the activity of your morning to fall away, and welcoming this opportunity to center and still as we quiet the mind and open the heart. How good it is to recognize the one power, the one presence, the one love that truly is all that there is. That infinite space and place that is compassion and grace and joy. I know that it is my life. I know it is the life of each person here. I know it is the life of each person listening to my voice right now. And so it is from this consciousness that I speak this word, anchoring truth, anchoring truth for each of us individually. I see and I know that all that we are called to be is revealing itself with flow, with harmony, with grace. And I see this world as we celebrate Earth Day. I just invite us all to call, call into consciousness this beautiful planet that we call home. And to just see it enveloped, held, nourished, supported, sustained, resourced, infinitely resourced. Seeing that wholeness and seeing the wholeness that is each individual. So we start with the macro and we, we move inward and we see every country, we see every state, every county, every principality, we see every city, every town. We see every one of the billions of people that call this planet home as the wholeness that they are. And we bless it all. We bless the oceans. We bless the plants and the rocks and the minerals and the animals and the humans. And we just, the invitation is to open your heart in gratitude. Gratitude for all this and so much more. That which we are stewards of, this magnificent planet Earth. And so it is. Amen. Ashe. <laughs> so it is Earth Day was actually yesterday, but we are celebrating it all weekend. And I believe it's a really important opportunity for us. Yes, we're going to stand in celebration. Yes, we're going to stand in gratitude. And I also believe that we need to stand in accountability. It's necessary. That if we're not holding ourselves accountable, then who is going to be holding us accountable? I can tell you who is going to hold us accountable future generations. That's who's going to hold us accountable. And it ain't going to be pretty. Right? It is not going to be pretty. So part of our connectivity, we read it, living in an awareness of unity with all. And part of our mission is we honor and care for ourselves, each other, and the natural world. Yes. And that really is asking us to step into something. It's asking us to step into a different relationship than we currently have with how we navigate the environment and our resources. 
Because if we don't step into a new relationship with how we navigate the earth and her resources, then there will be nothing left. And I don't want to be a downer <laughs> because I am very optimistic about what is possible. But I want to pinpoint where I think things began to go a little sideways. In scripture we have, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. That's a lot, right? That's a lot. That's a lot that we are being called to stand with. And the word here that I think is key is dominion. And where I think the challenge is around this word dominion is that for a lot of people, dominion means power over something. It means the powering over, to control, to subdue. And Unity understands the word dominion to mean spiritual authority. And can you feel how they're not the same thing? That when we're standing in our spiritual authority, what we're standing is our capacity to love, our capacity to be present, our capacity, as we say, to honor and respect and be committed to the unity of all. That's us standing in our spiritual authority. So it's not about power over something. It's not power over the fish or the creeping things, scary as those might be. But it means something different. And so we have been looking at the empowerment dynamic with um, David Emerald. And we're, the book study, I started last week with the talk. The book study is starting officially this week. So you can still sign up for uh, a small group if you like. And if you don't want to join a small group, that's OK. The book is still available for sale. And there are study guides out there. So you can do the work yourself, if you like, at home. And what David Emerald is talking about is what he calls BFOs, the blinding flash of the obvious, right? Blinding flash of the obvious. And future generations are going to look back at us and they're going to say, didn't they notice what was happening? It was so obvious. And sometimes the things that are obvious are the hardest things for us to be able to notice or be able to pay attention to. So he's, the book focuses on the drama triangle, Stephen Cartman's drama triangle that was introduced in the 1960s. And uh, David Emerald calls it the dreaded drama triangle. And he loves acronyms, so he calls it DDT for short. Because remember that toxic chemical yes. that kills everything? Well, that is what the dreaded, dry, dread, dreaded, <laughs> tongue twister time, right? Dreaded drama triangle will do to all of your relationships. And not just your relationships with others, it's your relationship with yourself, and it's also your relationship with God, and it's your relationship with Mother Earth. When the drama triangle is activated in your life, it infiltrates, informs every relationship that you have. Breathe with me on that. And the focus of the drama triangle is that there's a victim. There is someone that something is happening to. Poor me. There are so many problems. I'm powerless with, against any of this. Has anybody in here ever felt powerless? There you are sitting at the bottom of the drama triangle in that moment. And then there's always a persecutor. So in order for there to be a victim where something's being done to them, there has to be someone or something that is doing something to you. Can you feel that? So the persecutor wants to never be powerless again. Oftentimes it's a victim who has realized how much they hate being powerless, and so they become a persecutor. Because at least when you're being a persecutor, you feel like you have some sort of control. And let me be clear, these, di these, these roles switch and flop. I've said this last week. You're in an argument with a loved one, and don't you notice how you flip back and forth between victim persecutor, victim persecutor, why are you doing this to me? How dare you do this to me? Right? We flip back and forth in all of our relationships. And then there's the rescuer. 
And the rescuer is the person who's the knight in shining armor, or the knightess in shining armor, who's going to ride in on their horse, who is going to save the day because no one else has the skills or the capacities to be able to navigate life the way they can. Without meaning to, because it comes from a good place to want to help and be in service, the rescuer is keeping the victim a victim. Can you feel that? The rescuer is saying, oh, poor you. I'm so sorry that you're incapable. I can do this for you. Now, in Unity's understanding, we know that each person has everything available to them, always, always, even if they don't know it, even if they're not aware of it, they have the capability, the capacity to access the truth of who they are and to show up in a different way. But if the rescuer is coming in all the time to save them, are they ever given an opportunity to grow that capacity? They're not. And often for the victim, the, the, the rescuer will become their persecutor. And we, have, we talked about this last week where you, in the best of intentions, start out to help somebody, and then all of a sudden they're furious with you, and you're like, I don't know what I did. I was just trying to help. But you were trying to do something for them, to them, where innately we all know that we have what we need. We all innately know that. We just forget it a lot. But when we feel somebody coming down on us and saying, do it this way, that aspect of ourselves that stands in our own dominion, that stands in awareness of our spiritual authority, can rise up but doesn't necessarily know what to do. So we lash out. This is the dreaded drama triangle. Now, I talked about this last week as well, but can you feel how in unity we talk about evolving consciousness? So we start off with victim consciousness where we think everything's happening to me. The next level of consciousness is victor consciousness where things happen by me. I did that. It feels good, victor consciousness. But can you feel how it's the flip side of victim? It's the persecutor-victim relationship. I don't want to be, I don't want things to happen to me. I'm going to make them happen myself. The next level of consciousness is through me. Things are going to happen through me. And we begin to leave the fear and we begin to enter into faith. That there is something else that we can access that is larger than our understanding. And then the I amness, as me, the Christ Buddha consciousness. Now they nest. You see how they nest? So in moments of stress and anxiety, while we may be spending a lot of time in the channel through me, and we may be maybe at work, we're focused on the by me, I'm going to get this done. And in our practice, perhaps we're in the I amness. When things arise in our life, we may contract all the way back down to victim. Because it's still available to us. But just as victim is available to us, so is the I am available to us. Can you see that? It's a thought away. It's about growing and building consciousness. So when we're talking about the earth, I'm going to back up a little bit. Can you feel how the drama triangle is playing out and how we relate to Mother Earth? And there's lots of different permutations. The earth itself could be the victim. We could see ourselves as the rescuer. Poor you. Poor, poor Mama Earth who has no capacity on her own. Now, do we know that's not true. I mean, is the earth powerless? No, right? The earth is not powerless, right? The earth is powerful. The persecutor, that could be us too. Doing something to the earth. The persecutor could be corporations, could be big business. Rescuer could be science, right? Science will come in and save the day. The rescuer could be the generations to come, that we're pawning it off on future generations to come in and save the day. So we are being invited to grow in consciousness on every level. And when we're problem and fear oriented, we get caught in short-term thinking. When we're problem-focused, we get anxious. 
there's anxiety. So we shift our behavior because we're anxious. And then the behavior usually works to some degree to alleviate the problem. And once the problem is gone, what happens to our anxiety? It goes away too. And when the anxiety goes away too, what happens to the behaviors? They go away too. And then guess what? The problem comes back again. And we're caught in a cycle. So when we think about when the flooding was happening all throughout California and people are filling sandbags, there is a problem. There is a way that people are navigating that problem to fill those sandbags. And yet once the flooding recedes, what happens next? Anxiety has dropped. So the behavior does not show up in time and in space because it's short-term thinking. What we need to step into is vision, faith-oriented, that channel, the I am. We need to move away from victim victor to into this higher level of consciousness, which is orienting us past what's happening right here and right now, but putting, setting us up for the long haul. So the Iroquois have the seventh generation principle. And the seventh generation principle is that every action that they take, they look at it through the lens of the ramification seven generations from them. <sighs> is that long-term thinking? Is that vision-oriented thinking? Do we, as a, basically as a global consciousness, do we have anything like that operating right now? I mean, not even close. But if we don't, as there are groups, and I want to say this, there are a lot of organizations that are working towards long-term thinking. It is the new, it's the new thing. <laughs> Right? There's a book out called, um, comes from uh, Jonas Salk's quote here, it's called uh, Being a Good Ancestor. And it's about how you cultivate long-term thinking. Because the most important question that we do need to ask ourselves is, are we being good ancestors? Is that part of how we make our decisions? Is that part about how we think about the choices that we're making? Are we thinking past our children? Are we thinking to our children's children? Are we thinking to our children's children's children? Children. That's the type of long-term thinking, and it's vision that's going to pull us there, not problem-focused that is going to keep us focused just right here on me, 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 me. What's happening to me? Because when we are in victim mode and when we are caught in the drama triangle, we feel powerless. And this is what's happening to the earth because we are power. We feel powerless. Anybody in here feel powerless about what's happening to the earth? But we're not powerless. We actually have the capacity to be an agent for change and transformation. We actually have the possibility when we anchor ourselves in our spiritual principles. I have, my wife is a scientist. I have great faith in science. I believe in science. I believe that science is an expression of the divine in time and in space. I don't see it as an enemy to spirituality. Amen. It's not, right? And they're polarized. Can you feel how they're polarized? If we can bring our spiritual awareness into the playing field, that is how we're going to bring about to true change. That is how we are actually going to begin to think about the long-term impact of the choices that we are making every single moment of every single day. And change is happening. In the, in the book, he talks about flipping the drama triangle to the empowerment dynamic. So instead of a victim, you see how the victim was on the bottom of our original triangle? And now at the top of the triangle, because we flipped it, is the creator. What can we create? And that is who we know in unity that we truly are, that we are divine creators that we have that capacity within us made in the image and likeness. 
that we embody that capacity to actually create and make new. And instead of the, um, the persecutor, we get a challenger. We get someone who is challenging us to continue to grow, to continue to evolve. Not blaming, not putting us down, not denying, but, but challenging us individually and as a culture to shift, to change, to evolve. And then we have the coaches. And that would be instead of a rescuer, instead of somebody who's riding in on their white horse to make it all okay, that we have someone who is saying, we can do this, you can do this. Build the skills, build the knowledge, build the awareness so that you can be a force for change, that you can actually make a difference in the world. So Isatu Sise, she is from Gambia. She is a fierce challenger. Fierce challenger. Look at all of those plastic bags that she is standing in. A sea of plastic bags. And she just decided that this is not, this can't continue. And so she is considered to be one of the, the recycling queen of Gambia. Because what she did was create these programs where plastic bags are actually recycled and used for different products, for jewelry, for handbags. She created an entire industry that is churning out products that is made from what that looked like. Challenger, not accepting, but creating a space for a different way of thinking. Greta Thunberg, we know very well, climate justice. She's probably the, the, the most famous face. She was a child. I mean, this is the next generation. They see what we are refusing to see. They see it, and they are a force for change in this. So her focus is governmental, policy, legislation, how to actually go in there and make the big changes. Anybody in here feel less powerful than a, what is she, 16 now? She might be 19 at this point. She started off, she was 12. 12 year old girl creating change, challenging the status quo. AOC, now whether or not you agree with her politics, she is a proponent for the Green Deal. She has made that a, a major part of her platform, that it is not sustainable what we are doing to the environment. And she too is working in legislation. She is working from within the government. She is a challenger. Lesin Mutunke, he is from Kenya. He started when he was 12. The deforestation of Kenya broke his heart. And so he has started all these organizations and they go in and they plant trees, single-handedly changing the landscape. Now, those trees that they're planting, is he gonna benefit from it in his lifetime? No, and probably not even his children. It's the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. That's long-term thinking. One last challenger, Autumn Peltier. She is Canadian. She is an indigenous rights activist as well as a clean water activist. She is advocating throughout Canada and the world that we have to deal with the contamination of our water supply, that it is not something that we can wait on, that we have to do this work now. So there are challengers in the world right now. And I'm sure as you can see some of those names, they get a lot, of, they get a lot back from the world. They get a lot of accolades, and they also get a lot of vilification. That is what it means to be a challenger. That is what it means to actually take that act, that, that piece of you that knows that something needs to shift, and instead of trying to blame and tear down something, instead you step out and you build something. 
And in the building of it, when you are changing the status quo, there will be resistance. But there is a tipping point. And if everybody in this room just, and who's listening to me, said yes to becoming a challenger instead of a persecutor, yes. this would be a different world. Right? That's how we make change because it's happening in consciousness. So when we say yes and we take concrete steps, and that's going to look different for each one of us. For some of us, it's about money. For some of us, it's about time. For some of us, it's about, Chris and I, we only have one car. And people say, you only have one car. It's not because we can't afford another car. It's because we do not want to be part of putting a second car on this planet. And does it mean that sometimes we have to really do some interesting juggling with our schedules so that we can both get to where we need to go? Absolutely. It is not easy. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't call that back for anything because it's how we are personally showing up. So I was reminded of Mary Oliver's beautiful poem, What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And what if we thought about it as, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious world? What would that look like if we stepped into vision, if we stepped into long-term thinking, if we were actually willing to give up something that is convenient and comfortable and fast and actually perhaps take the slightly more challenging part so that we are actually making a difference, both in our own life, but then also how we interact with the world. It's wonderful if you're recycling and you're doing all the things in your own home. But can you take it to the next level? Can you actually be in service to your neighborhood? Can you actually be in service to your county? Can you actually be in service to your city, to your state? What is it that you can do that will move you into that next arena? Because the, the, the beauty of the world, there's only one. There's only one. And th this can't wait. Science tells us over and over, we are reaching a critical point. And if we don't change, nothing's going to change. So take a look at who you think is going to rescue you, us. Take a look at where you are actually being called to be the coach or the challenger or the creator rather than waiting on someone else or something else to solve the problem. So let's take this into a time of meditation. Jeremy, can you come on up here? So we're going to breathe. That was a lot, yeah? And I want everyone to remember that we're anchoring all of what I'm talking about in the field of potential, in the field of possibility, in the truth that there is something always more seeking to express as our life right now, not tomorrow, not if science fix that, figures out a quick fix and we don't need fossil fuel anymore. Something right now is available to each and every one of us. And it's inviting us to break free, to break open in a new way. So let's breathe together. And whatever might have gotten stirred up for you, I know my heart aches for this planet sometimes. My heart aches for the animals and the plants. My heart aches for the humans. And at the root of it all, in unity, we know there is only love. There is only life, 
always seeking to express more fully, more powerfully. And Mama Earth herself is that living expression of life. And so I invite you to see, I invite you to see the Earth whole. I invite you to catch the vision of what we're being called towards. That long-term vision. Unity in Marin's vision is that we are spiritually, we are, we are living in a world that is awakened through our spiritual realization of our divine potential. And as we stand in our spiritual authority, not power over, but spiritual authority, what is ours to do? How can we show up on this earth day making choices that shift the consciousness of this planet one step at a time, just one small step forward in a new way? So just see the world whole. allowing the problems to fall away and just allowing as we rest in the silence to listen. What is mine to do in order to make that manifest? What am I called to be, to do, to understand, to know, to live into for this incredible planet to continue to shine and live. So let's rest in the silence together as we listen for what is ours to do. And so it is from this space, this place, that we bless the earth. We bless each other. We let go of the guilt and the worry, and we just say, I am made new in this moment, and I say yes to making the world new, that I am listening to what I am called to be so that I may be a good steward, that I may stand in my spiritual authority and create a sustainable planet for seven generations and more. Opening in gratitude for Mother Earth, for all that she gives, for all that we receive. Oh, how good it is to just love the Earth and in agreement, we all say, and so it is. Amen. And our affirmation, my stewardship of the environment blesses future generations. Can we please know this together? My stewardship of the environment blesses future generations. And so it is.